Two years ago, we were in a conversation with Sadhguru and I asked him, we all know that anesthesia works, but we really don't know how it works. And can you, can you shed some light on it? And he talked to me briefly and then he said a statement, which is anesthesia, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sadhguru, because sometimes I might be wrong, <laughs> if I'm quoting you specifically. Uh, anesthesia cannot touch consciousness. It can only take away memory. I was blown away by that answer because that's not the way we think consciousness of. And um, maybe I thought several days I've had uh, sleepless nights thinking about maybe it's time for us to redefine the term consciousness itself. And having gone through several programs with him, I think I've some glimpses here and there to know that there's much more than what we know of. That's how this started. And um, so Emery, you are the one who has been doing a lot of work in this area. So you can probably start off telling me what we know now of how anesthesia actually causes um, loss of consciousness. Okay, so I'll start. And so again, it's a, it's a pleasure to share the stage with Sanguru and with uh, Nico. Um, so, you, you know, how does anesthesia work? Actually, how many people here had anesthesia? <laughs> oh. Great topic, right? Yeah, right, right. A lot of clients out there. Exactly, right, all right, all right, fantastic. So, so, so what happened to you? Um, you know, some people say we turn the brain off or we, you know, we make you unconscious, we put you in a coma. But I think the, so we've tried to really understand what's happened. And we've done this by doing a number of studies in humans as well as in animals. And so I'll just give you the, the, the quick back of the envelope way to think about it. When you take the anesthesia drugs or when they're given to you by the anesthesiologist, the brain isn't turned off. You know, it's not like all of a sudden the switch flips. If you look at what happens to the brain, it's actually in a highly, highly dynamic state. It's really, the actual circuits in the brain are oscillating. They're creating waves. And to give you some sense of this, if you look at my hands like this and they're oscillating now, this is the way your brain is in a normal state of, forgive me, consciousness, right? All right, all right, all right. As I understand it in my little limited way, all right, all right. But then what happens is the drugs take over the circuits and now the circuits oscillate like this. And as long as you keep the drugs there, they're doing that. Now, what does that mean? It means that if this brain area was communicating with that brain area so that you could be conscious, it can no longer do that. When you turn the drugs off, the brain returns, as long as you keep the drugs on it, it does this, it, it, it creates these oscillations. It's very much like this YouTube video, which I'm sure some of you have seen, where uh, you have a bridge in Tacoma, Washington, I don't know if you've seen this, the bridge in Tacoma, Washington, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, it starts to oscillate in a perfect sine wave, just like this, and no traffic can go across the bridge. It's the same thing that happens under anesthesia. And what happens is, is that these oscillations, because they're so strong, they take over the brain, they're not natural. And remember one of the, one of the things that Bala mentioned was that after anesthesia, our brains often don't work the way they, they did beforehand. So now you can see if you've been in a state like this for four hours, six hours, eight hours, and you know, look, I got my AARP card about 12 years ago myself, so I'm in that category too, right? You know. You can understand why your brain may not work, right? So, and, and basically that's it. And, and what's good about that, what's good about what I'm telling you is that we as anesthesiologists can see this state. We can see it on the EEG of patients in the operating room, and we can use it to change the way we deliver our drugs. That's the practical, the practical implication of this. And then the other practical implication of it is that as we take anesthesia seriously, in other words, don't say, oh, we just give you drugs and you go away and you come back. As we take it seriously and study it, then we can start interacting with our neurology colleagues and make links between problems that they're working on. We can actually begin to have conversations with you know, distinguished individuals like, like Sadhguru who can help us understand what is it we're actually doing on a deeper level. But if we haven't taken what we do seriously, in terms of 
how, what's happening in the brain, we're not in that position. And that's where I'd like to think that we're trying to move the, you know, the research now to, in other words, use anesthesia, the study of anesthesia, to help us connect with some of these deeper ideas about the brain, the mind, and also consciousness. David, do you have any thoughts on that? What, what we work on as neurologists, or what I work on, is very related and very, very connected in that we're trying to understand how patients who lose consciousness because they've had a structural brain injury or a cardiac arrest or some other kind of problem can reestablish the process of a conscious state in, in, in a brain that's been injured and what are the rules of the recovery and what are the ways in which it can happen and what are the limitations and how do people get stuck along the way and could we help them? And it turns out that there's um, a lot of you know, variation. Sadhguru. Oh, namaskar. Uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Skiff, highly accomplished uh, doctors in their areas of uh, proficiency, but I am completely unschooled. <laughs> so, uh, because for me, the only way I know anything I know is uh, from my own experience. So my language and my expression could be a bit abrasive, or if it seems abrasive, uh, please pardon me because uh, I'm nearly illiterate, <laughs> So, this… first of all, the nature of the language that we are speaking, I'm talking about the English language. This language is very good for describing and defining external things, but is very limited when it comes to internal dimensions of many aspects of who we are. So, if we have to use yogic terminology for this, what you're referring to as consciousness, is considered as jagruti, that means wakefulness. We do not consider wakefulness as consciousness. Wakefulness is the state of the body, wakefulness is the state of the mind, wakefulness is the state of the bioenergies within us, but that's not consciousness. What you're seeing as physical body, well, one thing I would like to clarify is, we do not look as brain as a very significant aspect because we see intelligence is right across the system. Mm -hmm. Generally, in most people's understanding, I believe, a combination of memory and intelligence is considered as mind. Am I right on this? If you take this as a definition, it is a fact that every cell in our body carries millions of fold much more memory than the entire brain can carry. Because these cells in the body remember even what happened a million years ago. It remembers the skin tone of your forefathers from a million years, nothing has changed. It never gets confused. So what you can carry in the brain as conscious memory compared to what every cell or every DNA is carrying is phenomenally more. And the chemical dimension of what is being conducted in every cell is far more complex than you could ever figure with your entire brain. So both in terms of intelligence and memory, the spread is much more. I think this entire focus on brain has come mainly because somewhere, probably uh, pre-Renaissance time, we broke into this because that region, largely we're talking about Europe, where it was hugely dominated by very dogmatic belief systems. When people broke through that, nobody was supposed to think for themselves, everything was already said and done. When people broke through that and started thinking for themselves, thinking little freely looked like absolute liberation for those people. 
And I think that hangover still lasts in our education systems, in our medical sciences, in the very way we are approaching even fundamental sciences. That hangover, that thought is everything, is very profoundly influencing our social structure and our way of exploration. In… <laughs> in the yogic sciences, we don't attach any significance to your thought. Whatever you're thinking, it's of no consequence to me. This is why I… whatever somebody is saying, we don't listen to them <laughs> We… we just feel them, we just feel them. What is their chemistry, what is their… how they are right now, I don't care what they are saying. This is how… <laughs> maybe it's an evolutionary problem with me because I've been in jungles by myself and I've seen most creatures judge you just like this. I've… Uh, <laughs> you know, I think they showed a picture of me having a king cobra. I've been very closely involved with all kinds of creatures, particularly cobras and things. Their sense of our chemistry is so keen. Mm -hmm. You can just go in the wild and just pick up a cobra. As you saw, I'm not holding him by his head, he's not a pet cobra, mm -hmm. he's a king cobra. <laughs> if he bites you, he won't give you more than twenty to forty minutes before you're done. But I'm just picking him up like this, he will do nothing because he is feeling my chemistry. If I show little agitation, he'll go for me. Mm -hmm. If… if I'm just… okay, he's fine with me. So, we don't attach any significance to thought because thought is recycling of the data that we have already gathered. No thought can come which is absolutely fresh permutations and combinations of the data that we already have. Right now, a lot of people coming up to me very fearfully and saying, Sadhguru, this artificial intelligence is coming, if they come, they will take over the world. I said, if they take over and run the damn thing, you're on a holiday, isn't it? <laughs> but it is a fact that everything that we can gather as information, analyze and express and use it in many ways, all these things machines will be doing it better than us in the next ten to fifteen years' time. Mm -hmm. Everything that is data-based processing, machines will do way better than us. So there is this fear, I think it's a very good time. This is the time we need to explore an intelligence beyond intellect. Because we have become so intellectual, we have become so brain-oriented in our approach to everything. As you rightly said, nothing is really turned off, we've just broken the communication. After all, the purpose is to go through something which is generally extremely painful without pain. That is how the entire anesthetic uh, science has come up. So, you're just breaking the communication and that's not happening, it serves that purpose. So being wakeful and being conscious are two different things. If we… is it okay if I take a few minutes <laughs> This is described like this. For wakefulness, we have a word called jagrati. Jagrati means you're awake. If ten people, let's say we take sample of ten people, they all fell asleep, don't do it, okay? They all fell asleep and they came awake. When they come awake, all of them will not be equally awake. One person may be instantly awake, another person may two, two, take two minutes, as you have noticed with anesthesia also. Sure. Another person will take an hour to wake up, another person needs a strong coffee, otherwise she won't wake up. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> like this, different levels of wakefulness is also there. Professors must have noticed Yes. <laughs> in fact, in fact, the first few minutes of the day can be like that. Different <laughs> levels of wake, wakefulness in a classroom. <laughs> so this is jagrati. So we are calling wakefulness as consciousness. No, the next dimension of consciousness is called uh, swapna. This means a dream state. Mm -hmm. A dream state is far more vivid than wakeful state for most human beings. It's like going to a cinema. If you go to a cinema, the key factor 
of the impact of the cinema on you is turning off the lights. This is something most people don't understand. <laughs> if you don't turn off the lights, cinema will be no good, it doesn't matter how well it's made. Turn on the lights and watch the cinema, you will see a great cinema becomes nothing. So turning off the lights is important. So turning off the lights in our experiences, the eyelids, you down the shutters, the world is off. Now you start your own world. So dream state is like a cinema, it's far more impactful. People love their cinema stars more than the people that they've lived with for twenty-five years. <laughs> but they have not even seen them, all they saw was play of light and sound. Mm -hmm. But that is far more impactful simply because lights are off. So, eyelid is that, if you t roll it down, light should be off, world should be closed. But right now, the problem is this mental faculty has not been taken charge of, so it's running wild all the time with eyes closed. So this dream state is considered a more powerful state than Jagriti. Jagriti or wakefulness is important per per performing action in the world. But for human consciousness, in terms of profoundness of experience, dream is always more profound than walking on the street. Yes, most of you have experienced this. The next state is called a susupti. Susupti means it is a dreamless state. But there are dimensions of consciousness that you are aware of. It's a totally dreamless sleep state, but you are aware. There is no picturization, there is no video running in your mind, there are no pictures, there are no people, there are no words, but you're conscious in your sleep. This is a very powerful state. If you really want to manifest something in your life, this is something to be explored. And the next one is called as Turya. This is consciousness where there is no memory involved of any kind. Essentially in the yogic sciences, we are looking at consciousness as an intelligence beyond memory. Mm -hmm. If there is memory, memory is considered a boundary in the sense. Uh, this is one person, this is another person, simply because this embodies one kind of memory and that embodies another kind of memory. This has become one kind of person, this has be become another kind of person. Essentially, it is in the memory. Memory does not mean just what I remember and you remember, Genetic memory is there, evolutionary memory is there, elemental memory is there, atomic memory is there, karmic memory is there. Inarticulate and articulate memories are there, but generally we are thinking memory means consciously what we can remember. Mm -hmm. But today, if we eat dog food, we'll not become dogs. Something within us remembers, no matter what you eat, this has to be only transformed into human being. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you eat. If you and a cow every day eat a mango, no merger will happen. Perfect memory is established, evolutionary memory is absolute. Mm -hmm. So these different dimensions of memory are playing on a daily basis. People are thinking their thoughts are free. <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> because <laughs> your memory is determining everything. So largely in one single word we call this karma. Karma means the residual impact of all the memory that you have, how it is impacting every thought, every emotion, every action, the very way you sit and stand. Mm -hmm. See, if you… if you see somebody walking far away, let's say half a mile away you see someone walking, if he's your friend, just the way they're moving their body, you say, oh, that's him. There are seven billion plus people but this particular man walks in a unique way, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> all right? Just two leg walking, everybody walks, but still it is so unique. So this is what we are referring to as karma, that the residual impact of memory, varieties of memory. We rec recognize memory as eight basic forms of memory, which are determining how you are right now. The very way you sit, stand, breathe, understand, perceive life is determined by this memory. But there is an intelligence beyond memory, which we call as Turya or Chitta. This is consciousness. Now, every one of us is conscious. The question is only of degree. Even a rock is conscious, a dog is conscious, a pig is conscious. 
The question is only of degree, how conscious? Even among us, how conscious is different from person to person. So, this degree of consciousness determines everything. Now, if we have to give an analogy, what is memory is like, I'm sure every one of us at some stage in our life, I don't know if you're still doing it, we blew soap bubbles. Did you? Hello? Come on, everybody raise their hand for anesthesia. <laughs> 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 So when you blow a soap bubble, the soap part of it, which is very little, just a tiny drop, the large part of it is air that it captures. So how big a bubble? When you were children, who can blow the biggest bubble was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it's a certain amount of technique, <laughs> yeah, <it's good. laughs> how you do it. <laughs> somebody blew this big bubble, somebody got only this much. So how big a bubble? This bubble is like this, the kind of soap and how it gathers is your memory. It forms a… it gives it a form. But when the memory bursts, there is no such thing as your air and my air. There is no such thing as your consciousness and my consciousness. There is something called as your body and my body. There is something called as your memory and my memory. There is something called as your intellect and my intellect but there is nothing called as your consciousness and my consciousness. How much of it did you capture? How big is your bubble will determine the scale of your life. Mm -hmm. The scale and possibilities of your life are determined by how big a bubble did you blow. Mm -hmm. Okay <laughs>